631. Um, the rocks very well clear and set up for location's sake. Uh, board of school directors. Um, first order of business is public comment. Um, no one in the room. Uh, anyone on Zoom? We're going to have to rewind your screen. Um, so, hey Scott, are you just? I just want to know: Are you in a? Is here on an iPhone? Are you um, traveling? Should we not call on you? I am traveling. I should be there uh, in about ten minutes. All right, perfect. Thanks. Um, second reporter business can. Consent agenda. Uh, I want to know if we have some co curricular additions. Um, you need to take out the resignation, which is like a thought on the resignation. So take that out. Okay. Right now. So we will add the co curricular additions, subtract the resignation, say hi to Crystal. Uh, Uh, I move the consent agenda minus the resignation. Yeah. Uh, do you have a second? Second. Um, I just want to note a couple of hippos in this letter. One is a total net, which is everything is K except for one number. And then there's an extra capitalized. But since my name is on it, I care. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> <laughs> no. specific no, I am. We don't need to call anyone out. We should fix it. <laughs> okay. We will fix that, Jim, before okay. we sign it. Thank you. Um, is that the letter, the Arbesser letter? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think those are minor enough that we don't need a new motion. No, no, it's, okay. it's a lowercase p. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Consent agenda moves forward. Um, we also have a couple other things we want to add to the agenda. Um, the equity committee uh, would like to put forward, I think, their choice for someone to do an equity audit because they've been working very hard to interview folks and their family. Uh, and several several uh, bids on our proposal for an equity audit. Um, and also, we need a uh, quick executive session to update on negotiations, which will hopefully be quick and um, and uh, not take too much time. Uh, so, board learning focus um, uh, Central Vermont Career Center presentation with Jody. I'm assuming yeah. Jody's online. I don't know if we have her. On screen, but um, there's Jody, and most of the board members have their computers up. I just look at yours. Yeah, that's fine. I, I, shared, I, I, I don't just because we didn't have a projector in here, I shared the presentation with all the board members, and I will share it on my Zoom screen um, so everybody sees it. And let me get that up for you, Jody. No problem. Thank you. This is actually the presentation that we used this week for our curriculum and instruction review. So we have um, the Southern Regional Education Board tech centers that work with us this week. And um, on Tuesday, they showed up and interviewed a bunch of staff and students today with a team um, from a couple of sending schools and some <coughs> Montpelier, um, Matt McLean joined us as one of our team members. And he was here five years ago when we did this process before. So thank you for letting him uh, be a part of that. And they observed our programs today. And in the four hours that we have kids, they had 55 observations. So lots of great data to look at. Um, so really exciting, but this, um, this presentation was really set up for them. So it has a lot of information that I'm probably not gonna spend a lot of time on for you, just because it's, it's sort of redundant and information that you already know. And so one of the things that I had talked about during the budget presentation is that the one of the board's next steps for the Central Vermont Career Center School District, and thank you for 
giving us Jill, who continues to be our board chair, um, newly elected again. Thank you. Um, we, we have this tagline, education that works, but we don't have much of a mission statement. We don't have one that we've adopted as a district. You can move to the next slide, Libby. Um, and when I did some research to try to find that for the, the folks at the curriculum and instruction review team, I found um, on the next slide, the 2018-2019 draft that was done before I arrived at the Central Vermont Career Center. And as far as I can tell, it wasn't approved by anyone. It was just drafted. And then I think what might have happened is they jumped into this process at the Career Center where they were looking at re-envisioning and potentially moving and, and did a little study around that to see is our space adequate for the programming that we really need to offer, which it's not, and what, what ways can we remedy that? And then also on the governance mission to start this the Central Vermont Career Center School District, which has obviously happened. So I think this got left behind in all of that work. And so it's something that my board is going to probably be taking up when they have their retreat in June, which I'm excited to be a part of that discussion and to see where that goes. On the next slide um, is the portrait of a graduate that the teachers here did again before I got here. And you'll see that a lot of the skills here are the transferable skills, or work habits that um, all of our city schools are working towards. And then there's also those academic and technical proficiencies. And so um, this was developed before I got here. And then the next three slides are some work that the faculty and staff did in identifying the values that they have, but also the values that they believe that Central Vermont Career Center instills in our students. And so those are integrity, respect, and responsibility. And in the process that we used with uh, Brene Brown's work, Dare to Lead, we, we brought out what does that look like? And so these wordles are basically how my staff and some students see these, these values and how what they look like, what we might see in our students and staff when they're living by these values. If you move on, um, this was just a slide to let everyone know in the on the team who are my instructors, who are the folks that they're going to meet this week when they were here. The next two slides are from the annual report, and hopefully you had an opportunity to see that. We dropped off a bunch at Montpelier High School and also at the town clerk's office, and we have plenty here. So if you want one, we can get you one. I can also probably before this meeting, before I'm done here in this meeting, I can share the link to our, our virtual annual report for you as well. So that talks about all the programs we have, which are great, and some of the data that you saw in a different format in our um, budget presentation in the fall around enrollment, how many students are coming from what schools. So when we, um, the fall semester, we had 35, we have lost a few students over the um, year, and I don't know which Sunday schools they're coming from, so I don't have the most up-to-date data. I'm hoping you still have around 35 students with us. Um, the next slide was definitely one that was in the budget presentation, and so I won't repeat that. But if you have, because you have access to it, if you have any questions and you want to go back to a slide later, we'll certainly do that. I just don't want to take up too much of your valuable time. Um, the, the next slide I really like, I don't think that um, we had a lot of opportunity to talk about that in the fall, and it, it's one of the areas that I feel people know the least about. And so I probably spoke to the fact that all of our students either earn industry-recognized credentials or college credits in their programs, and in some programs they earn both. And this um, piece of our annual report really breaks down which they get, what are the things they get out of each program. And so it's really exciting to take a look at baking and culinary arts and see that they're getting three credits out of White, White Mountain Community College and they are getting the tier two IRC of Serve Safe or that our paramedicine program, which is our EMS two, those students are getting 24 credits from BTC, um, paramedicine one, paramedicine two, and they'll have nine credits left to get that certification and that's a summer that's coming up. So it's really exciting to see how many credits that students can earn and just how much they can accomplish while they're here. Some of our students in um, plumbing and heating or 
in electrical, for example, will get their level one apprenticeship license when they when they sit for those exams this spring. And they'll be able to be co-op students next year and work in a job four days a week earning like so not quite full time, but darn close to it as a senior in high school. And if they want taking those classes at night to get the next level of apprenticeship and take that next level test. And a lot of um, the, our industry partners will help pay for that for them. It's a great opportunity for students across our region. On the next one, slide is directly from the, um, the budget slideshow that I did, I think, and I, I edited a little bit, just letting people know that there are proficiency documents for the state of Vermont for CTE. So it, when you're looking at a program, any student, whether they're in my automotive program or another automotive program, we have the same standards and they're all linked in that piece. And so if you have that um, slideshow, you get to click on that and find that site online and you can look at any of those. And we're all doing that work. And I think the next, the teachers across the state developed those proficiencies together, looking at some national standards and their next step as they work together, they they get to have professional development twice a year. So once in the fall and once in the spring. So all the building trades teachers get together, the construction trades get together once in the fall and once in the spring across the state and work on this, this stuff. And so they've been aligning their programs to these proficiencies. And the next step is building rubrics for these standards. The next slide is something, um, it's been around for a little while since 2019. And this is, when we had credits before proficiencies were in some of our schools. Um, this is what students earn when they're in our programs. So if they are proficient in our programs, then they have demonstrated the proficiencies for courses in English, math, science, art, social studies, and some additional credits and we or, or proficiencies. I know that last year, um, we this is an old document because last year we also added health to medical professions because of the college credits they get in that class. Um, we are a full day program, even though we're only four hours a day because we meet the 1200 minutes a week requirement for full day. Other CTE centers have two hour programs each day. Or, and so you might have kids going two hours in the morning to a program and different kids coming in in the afternoon for a two hour program. And then their programs tend to be two years to get in the same amount of um, learning that our students get in one year. So we are called a full day center, even though we're not yet full day as far as students are being on campus. I talked a little bit about the new governance model and how this is our first year as a new district where Tech Ed District 004, the fourth one in the state. Um, we did some training with the folks in the next slide that are here with us this week from SREB. And we did our teams of teachers developed wildly important goals. And so we had a goal for the career pathways. They were collecting and analyzing some data regarding program viability and program needs. And our board actually acted on that last night. Some of the data they collected and some that we collected in our comprehensive local needs assessment last year. So we are closing our natural resources program for next year. And I have submitted the request to open a welding program for next year. So those, those are some of our next steps based on that data that that team prepared. They've moved on to trying to figure out how to get more information from our alumni. Something that we heard across the uh, boards, and I think yours was one of them, asking for do we have data beyond that six month range about our former students and where they are now? And so that's what the Career Pathways team has taken on now. Our instruction team has a goal around work keys. Work keys is an assessment. It's actually three assessments in math, reading and graphic literacy that students in CTE centers across the state take. Was there a question? No, okay, so I'll, I'll keep going. I'm gonna roll like through all this stuff. I know it's a lot of information and then I'll, I'll finally be quiet until you ask me a question that I need to, but we, we do the three assessments in the fall and the spring for work keys. I do share that um, data with our sending schools, our high schools. And our, we saw too many of our students go backwards last year. And so we set a goal to improve every student's score, at least one of their testing scores 
this year and utilizing the curriculum. And so we're hopeful that the curriculum was helpful in doing that. And then our student leadership team has been working to create opportunities for student voice and students have taken on some ownership in our quarter awards assemblies and, and they also created a program swap day where they had the opportunity to try out a different program, um, which was a lot of fun in January. Now the next slide, Libby, thank you. Um, I did talk about when I was in Montpelier uh, in December about our new EMS2 where students are getting those 24 credits and doing that paramedicine work with VTC and how we've added the certified clinical medical assistant and phlebotomy to our MedPro program this year, which is great. And we're working on building a pathway uh, to get students into a nursing at VTC or the Vermont State University system sooner um, so that they can start on that pathway before they graduate from high school. And our phlebotomy kids have been doing live draws. And if you're, uh, wanting to volunteer. I'm sure they're still looking for some volunteers to come in and, and they can practice. Mia looks yeah. really interested. <laughs> yeah, they have to do 30 draws before they can sit for the exam for that certification. It's the poor guy who does personal. <laughs> <laughs> we are also excited about our new program, Design and Fabrication. We were only able to get two students in it this year, um, which has actually been wonderful in allowing our new instructor to really build this program. It started from nothing uh, with the support of the Vermont Granite Museum and the Granite Association. And they, the students have been um, carving granite in the last two weeks, which is really exciting. Tomorrow and Friday, they're gonna be doing some bronze casting. They worked with the, um, the guy, the blacksmith out in Marshfield and made some of their own tools. And they have been visiting at, a bunch of different stone sheds in Barrie. They've worked with some of the best stone artists, marble, slate, et cetera, across the state. They've worked with VTC to do some 2D and 3D design. And it's just been a really exciting thing to watch come into play. And I know um, our team was really excited to see that program today when they visited. I already talked about the added credits in baking and culinary when we looked at that sheet of credits in tier two. IRCs. One of the things I'm super excited about is we have been working to get an equity scholar in residence. Um, it's a program that Washington Central Unified Union School District has, that's on the next slide. And they work with the Institute for Liberatory Innovation. And basically the equity scholar, if they're full-time in your schools or district, they come in about three days a week and work with staff and students and get to know everyone. And then they're a resource for when something happens, when there's a hard conversation, when there's an issue that can also help us at the CTE to figure out how do we attract and keep students who are of non-traditional gender in our programs. And so that's some of the work that we're gonna um, focus a little more on in the months to come. And uh, we were able to hire with them. I will not employ this person, the Liberatory Innovation Institute does. Um, so I pay them and they employ them. So they, I don't supervise them. They come in as a resource to us and they can, they don't have to answer to me. So I think there's, there's some value in that piece as far as them being able to support across the board, but also know that we have this relationship that allows them to go back and like process with the Institute folks and then come back with some resources that are going to help us move forward. So we're excited about that. Um, we hired a, a person who's actually on the Harwood board. His name is Life, and he's been working with the Tarrant Institute um, at UVM, and he's gonna come join us starting next month, a day a week until he can start full-time. And then next year, he'll be with us full-time. So we're excited about the work that we're gonna do with an equity scholar in residence next year. Um, we have been working to, to try to figure out how to get a full day with academics. We have decided to take phase one on next year and embed English and STEM into, so an academic teachers into our current program, keep our program schedule for next year, and then go into that full day. The following year, we were struggling to find qualified candidates. I'm sure it's not a surprise across all our schools. There are positions that are unfilled. And we were concerned that we wouldn't be able to do this successfully and it wouldn't benefit everyone's students, including yours, if we didn't do that. 
We continue to look at additional programming and the potential for a new building or new spaces for our programs. For instance, the welding program is likely going to be a collaboration with a local industry in Barrie, and we'll be using their space for our workshop and our space for the classroom. I, I touched on the um, collaboration towards the pathways in health sciences. I've also been supporting work in advanced manufacturing. I think that our welding program, once we get that off the ground and the design and fab fit into this, but it's the advanced manufacturing one is quite, quite complicated and involves many other centers, especially River Valley. So it's just some of the work that I've been involved in and in trying to partner with setting schools and post-secondary institutions to get pathways for students to get to an associate's degree upon graduation from high school. And thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks, Jody. Um, super helpful and informative. Uh, questions for Jody about the presentation or otherwise? Yeah. Um, Jody, yeah, thank you for that. That's, um, and I'm a huge fan of the Career Center, as I think I've mentioned before, but just it's really exciting to see what you're doing with the students and um, and to see all the, the diversity of programming that you have. And I, my question is about, I, well, two questions. One is about the um, the decision to stay a uh, half day program. It makes sense um, given the challenges that you're facing. And I'm curious to know what the downsides are to this and if there's anything that uh, our students are missing out on. I feel like one of the biggest downsides for students is that they they go to your school, they get on a bus, they come to my facility, they access a program that most of them are really happy and excited to be a part of and engaged in, and then they get back on a bus, go back to your school, and hopefully, and they're engaged in a class there that may or may not be at the same level, and it's at the end of the day, which is the hardest time traditionally for a student to stay focused. And if it's a class that they don't enjoy or is, aren't as engaged in as much, it makes it really hard for them and hard for the, the teacher for them to tuition kind of transition back. And so that's one of the things that I'd like to see less of that, especially the, the time in between of having to transition from one space to another and then focus on whatever that academic subject is. I think that's hard. And Think about it for some of our other sending schools, for students who go to Cabot or who go to Harwood, it's even further distance that they have to go and to access some of their coursework that they still need. So if we have a central location where they're able to come here and do all of that, that's great. I've seen some data from some of our sending schools that our students, even though they have classes at their sending school, are not going back to. And for some of our students, that means that the semester they get pulled out of our program because they have to take more classes at their sending school to make sure that they're gonna be able to graduate on time, which proficiency was supposed to help us to sort through and kind of take away those, everyone should graduate in four years, some could graduate in three, some could graduate in more, but we're still on a four-year program across all our schools and, and there's still that sort of expectation. And it, it pains me to see that we're, there are ways that kids are slipping through the cracks and not getting what they need. And so I feel like that's what motivates me the most in wanting to have kids here for the full day academically. I also think that we could make the academics meet, like really collaborate with our program teachers so that it's similar with the work that the kids are doing in program relates to what they're doing in their math class or what they're doing in their social studies class to some degree, while still also allowing them to meet the standards. I think too, one of the things that we realized, especially late yesterday, um, as I'm getting the data from Sunday schools about what classes of the students that were accepted first round need, there were a lot more students who needed physical education than I had anticipated in this round. And so that's one of the things that we're really gonna need to think about as we move forward next year and really plan how to meet everyone's needs is we don't know until now in March, our first set of accepted students, what they need. 
And so then we're like trying to figure out how do we meet that need? Do we have the right teachers in place for that? Do we have some folks who maybe could get those credentials? Can we partner with our sending schools? I mean, Spalding's right next door. Is there a way that we can work with them if we need a little extra than what we have, what we thought we would need? So there were a few surprises and I think that could happen every year because the students coming in at least for a while until we settle into a rhythm with all our sending schools and we have counselors on board who know if this student is likely to head towards CBCC, then we need to make sure that we get these base courses out of the way first. If we can yeah. do that, there's some things that we're still trying to problem solve. Driver's Ed is a big one. Yeah. Um, special education services is another yes. big one. Yeah. So we have we there's some things that we just have to figure out together yeah. that we've been yeah. we've been having some good conversations around. And Jody, you were saying you're trying you have an open position for special ed. You just haven't been able to fill it. We year. we posted as anticipated, and we're going to actually take that off and keep it open and try to hire so that we can hire someone who can come in and get familiar with our programs and our students and knows how to support them when we're able to do the full day next year. So I think this additional year of planning, while I wish we didn't need to take an additional year, I feel like it's it's going to give us the opportunity to get what we really do need in place for all our students to be successful. So like Libby said, do we have a driver ed teacher here? That was not in my plans at all. And Certainly, a superintendents and some of our sending school counselors were like, well, we could collaborate somehow. And so that discussion just started and that we need to work through that and figure that out. Yeah. Well, we will. I, I can understand the desire to want to get going, but I also think it's smart to take your time and do it well. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And then my other question was just if there's any update on a, a location for a new building that's all your own. I wish. <laughs> Jody, did you I buy a building yet? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't won the lottery or figured out the school construction <laughs> stuff enough to know how to do that. What we did do last night as a board is we separated our finance and facilities committees. And so there will be a facilities committee that can devote some time to this. Honestly, in this first year, the board was getting together. We were figuring out how to be a school district and what we needed to do and working through some of those pieces. And so I think we're poised now to start having those discussions. And anyone who um, has some ideas and wants to present them to the facilities committee, I believe they meet the first Tuesday of every month. And you can go on our website and the cbtcc.org and you can see there's right in the middle there's a tab for the board and every board document we have is out there so you can log in there and see when we have a facilities meeting coming up and see what's on the agenda and jump right in as community members and give us some feedback right thank you other questions i have a question sure. um I've just, I mean, based on what I've heard from students, how um, is the transportation like system like at CBCC? So um, this year we started a new uh, policy around parking. So we have a limited, we lease our space from Spalding High School and we have a limited amount of spots in the parking lot. And so we decided, we also looked at our data from previous years and students who drive and had a tendency to be tardy more frequently than any other students and leave earlier than any other students. And so we made it a policy that if you had a, a, a class at your sending school, you needed to take the transportation provided by the sending school. So each of our sending schools sends a bus. And so they would need to make sure they access that bus to get here or there's the alternate some folks choose to park on Air Street, which is right outside of here and if they, refused to ride their school bus, but that was our piece. And then as soon as they could prove that they didn't have uh, a class at their sending school, they would move onto the parking lot list or they'd be on a wait list because we've actually oversold our parking lot. And if all of our students were here on one day that had parking passes, we wouldn't have enough space for them. Okay, thank you. Good question. <clears throat> Any other questions? Did you say that, Krista? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, thank you, Jody, so much. It sounds like you are 
grinding through a lot of pretty complex um, challenges. Um, so thank you for that work and that effort. And just also thank you, Jill, for all of the time and effort that you're putting into um, sharing the committee over there. We are grateful for you. Um, I had a few questions. One is if we could get a reminder of how special education services are currently provided to our students enrolled um, at, uh, at CVCC and how those services extend into their, their time with you. Um, and, and then I had a question about uh, like, once you're fully staffed with, you know, English, math, um, you know, these kind of content core academic areas, um, what will that look like? Will that look like having an English and math class there? Or will that look like those instructors kind of, um, closely working with your trade instructors to have that like embedded within their, um, you know, their technical education, and then my last was, I distantly remember driving in my car and I think hearing something that sounded like an initiative by Governor Scott that was really sounded like there was going to be like an infusion of, you know, funding support for CTE. And I'm wondering, like, how you see that trickling into uh, your programming and if any of that supports you to um, staff the program, you know, with academic instructors and high quality tech ed instructors. So that was three questions. It was kind of a lot, but that's what's on my mind. Thank you. <laughs> uh, first question was around special education services, and it really um, depends on the school a little bit. So what we have here, uh, Carrie Cook came from Montpelier. She last worked there. She's our special ed services coordinator. And so she works with all our sending schools and makes sure that we have um, a say in the meetings of ma making sure that the program is an appropriate placement and making sure that we can be safe, have that student be safe here and also support them in the ways that they need. So she has all the plans and she she helps make sure that all our teachers have that information at the start of the school year and she supports them with what they need. And she will often also support students who need sp some specific com accommodations here. We have two of our sending schools who send their case managers because they assign um, CVCC students or outplacement students to a specific case manager. And so we have one, one sending school that sends their case manager twice a week. She's here during program time on Monday and Thursday. And so she does support the students when she's here. And she also is aware of exactly what's happening in all of our programs where she has students. And so she's able to support them outside of here. Another sending school sends one, um, their person one day a week and he does the same thing. Others, um, we try to communicate with them, with the case manager about the needs of if the student's not finishing some of the things they might need to or might need a little additional support. A lot of services are provided at the sending school right now instead of in our time because we need those four hours a day for the uh, program. But we, we, we do offer the accommodations and supports that are needed as frequently as possible. Um, the second question was, what will the schedule look like? There is a draft, there would be three different schedules running at the same time for programs. So there would be some programs that would maintain their four hour morning block. There would be some programs that would have three full days a week because they tend to um, have larger labs that they need to do or they're out in the community or in their lab spaces outside more frequently. Um, and then we have another end of day set um, which actually the medical professions for the most part, the health sciences wanted that end of day. So we have three different models for the programs and that, that staggers academic classes separate from those programs. Mostly the financial literacy and math and social studies, potentially driver's ed would be a piece of that. There might be some room for additional services in that time. The English and the science would tend to be still embedded and be in blocks where the teacher pushes into the program. One of my goals, my son was a student at Randolph Tech and um, he had a wonderful experience there, but he was pulled out for his from program for his classes. And so he might be gone for an hour in the morning. Some of his peers might be gone for an hour in the afternoon. They needed a different class. And the teacher didn't always have the full class there. And I, I see that having taught before as a really difficult way to have to instruct students and keep them kind of on track to get all the skills that they need. So the goal of my schedule was to make sure that we weren't pulling kids out. If we were pushing in academics, great, 
but I don't want them being pulled out of the program to go somewhere in different spaces and, and at different times, because that I think eats away at the core skills for that program. Um, it is, I did present it in full, um, the schedule plan to the board last night. So it is part of our um, video from last night's meeting. And I do have the documents that I can forward to Libby that she could share with you around what the schedule, what our current plan for the schedule is. And funding support. So a lot of studies and some specific grants for electric vehicles were given out to CTE from the state of Vermont. Uh, we do have time grants that have been a traditional grant process and that is usually used for equipment or um, staffing of new programs. So the design and fabrication program is the instructor's salary is paid by a time grant right now. I'm hoping that I can still pay 50% of the, that with a time grant next year and slowly reduce from that. We also get Perkins funding, which is federal funding. We get an allocation and then we have to write the grant based on that allocation. Um, our equity scholar in residence comes from that. Our EMS two instructor, because we are splitting the program next year, was EMS one and two was taught by the same instructor this year with a cap of 16 students. Next year we have 12, no, 16 in EMS and 10 in EMS two. And so we are hiring a new EMS instructor and moving our EMS die up to the EMS level two. So that will come out of Perkins. So we have three, um, our literacy interventionist is in Perkins too. So literacy interventionist, um, ESR and new EMS two position out of Perkins. So that's some of the funding that we have. We did budget to hire at least two, maybe three instructors depending on negotiations. And so that's where we're hiring that English teacher out of. We already have the STEM uh, coordinator who is a science licensed science teacher here. So they're already on staff. So we're hiring an English teacher and we're ho hoping to hire the special educator that we can start working with. That would become the bill back model later, but not now because right now they wouldn't necessarily be providing as much services as they would in the future. Great, thank you, Jody. Other questions for Jody? Any from those board members on the screen? Great, well, thank you. This is super informative. And um, again, thanks for all the work you're doing. And another thanks to Jill for being our representative and sharing. I know that um, it's a lot of work on both your behalf. So thank you very much. Thank you. Jody does a phenomenal job. It's really, really neat to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Great, so we are now on to our policy monitoring. Uh, we have two policy monitoring reports, F20 fiscal management and C5 firearms. And I know that the finance committee, I believe met before this meeting. So if they have anything to report out on Fiscal management. The finance committee needs to reschedule their meeting because it didn't happen. It because Rhett was the lone member who oh, was there. So no quorum. <laughs> no quorum for the finance okay. committee. So we're rescheduling that um that piece. Okay. Um should we delay the fiscal management approval then? Or did, um that wasn't on the agenda to talk about in the finance committee. We certainly can. Okay. But that wasn't on the agenda to talk about there. Okay. Good. Um you will probably see the audit again. Okay, yes. Um, so do I have a motion to approve fiscal management and firearms? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? I have one question and then sort of a request. Um, on the fiscal management one, there's something referred to as a student activity account. What mm -hmm. is that? It's when um, student activities is when students actually make some money. Oh, so students, so things like sports tickets could go into a student's activity account or when Main Street Middle School kids sell furniture they make that goes into a student activities account. Like it's, it's just, it's a separate account that, that is dedicated 
an income source almost for, for kids that they've made and will go back to kids. Yeah. So, so then it would be used for like the next class that makes the yeah. furniture or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and then the one thing <clears throat> I noted on the fund balance, um, I think you said something in the monitoring report about the board voting on all fund balance. I think, well, we vote when we see something like the quarter quarterly financial report in the um, consent agenda. But I remember that there are times where we have like proactively voted on something to put it into fund balance, but then there's other things that just are there. And I think it would be, my request is I think I it would be helpful for me to have more clarity around when it needs to be a proactive board vote and when it's something that the administration does and we're just, you know, kind of like approving or accepting. That may be in another policy, but but okay, I'm, I could be wrong there too. So okay. let me write that down and get back to you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, those are my two things. Emma? Um, I just wanted to thank Libby for putting the note in the firearms policy monitoring report to like ping the policy committee around some suggestions that had um, been brought up in the past for improving that policy, that was really helpful. Um, and then I had a question about, are the policy monitoring reports for like one year from the date of, so when you say there have been no reports of students in possession of firearms on school grounds, is that good for the past 12 months or what are we talking about there? That's an excellent question. Because <laughs> I think about that too, when I have to monitor a policy like the firearms policy. Now, firearms on camp, firearms is maybe not be the best example because the board would be alerted in an executive session should firearms be on campus, um, especially if it was a student. Uh, however, I have that same thought. The way that I have, um, and the board is welcome to tell me to do it a different way. The way that I think about it is that unless the policy, unless I'm monitoring a policy like this in September, where it doesn't make sense to say I haven't seen any yet in this school year because the school year is so new, then like now in March, it's for this school year. Um, but if it were early in the year, it would have been, I would have, it would have been from last school year or the last time I monitored the policy. Um, but I'm open to suggestions because that is definitely something I think about when I monitor policies like this. <laughs> I was just thinking it would be nice just for public record to like include, so whatever it is, to just include that in the language. So if you're saying there have been no reports, you know, since the beginning of the school year or this school year, there have been no reports, something just to clarify to for sure. people. Yep. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Yeah. But I think that makes sense. I mean, I think it might make sense to, you know, I don't know if you monitored this exactly 12 months ago, probably not because we had put it all on pause. So it almost feels like it might be good to plan on, I mean, I don't know how other people think about this, <laughs> but to plan on on uh, monitoring it for the date, you know, from the date that it was last monitored to now type of thing, if possible. But that was, that's just my gut feeling. Thank you. Great. Any other comments on the monitor reports? Uh, this is Jill. I, I think what Emma suggested is a good idea <laughs> thinking about other times in management or supervision where you sort of say, you know, the date range that that applies to. So that makes a lot of sense to me to either be specific about the timing or, <coughs> or the date range. I can do that. Um, we have a motion, right? We have, yep. yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Great. Passes. And then we have third policy reading of D22 library materials. Uh, Emma, do you want to say anything about um, you know, the changes we made and feedback incorporated? 
Um, yep. So we just incorporated everything that um, that people had said at the last meeting, and we're waiting on a little bit of um, feedback. But I can kind of go through from top to bottom. I think that might be helpful. And then if there's anything to add, um, people can speak up. So, um, so this was a con this was something that had come up in discussion last time, and we were waiting for feedback from the librarians on this. So there was a suggestion made about like, do we want, and, and maybe just not about this policy in particular, but like all of our policies moving forward, do we want a little section in the policy that talks about the types of things that we would want monitored to show, you know, indicators of success, something like that. Um, I don't know how Libby feels if that would be helpful to have like a little guide in there of like a couple of things that would be, that we would consider as the board indicators of success meeting this policy, you tend to do like an interpretation, you know, that type of thing. So I don't know if it would be helpful or it doesn't seem like it's um, typical practice, you know, in the VSBA model policies, they don't include that type of thing um, typically. So, but it could be something that we add to our policies like language around indicators of success. Anyway, specifically relating to this policy, we had, I had uh, sent an email out and I think I have um, feedback from the librarians down here on one of the lower comments. Um, you do it, the last comment, third, in that string. Okay, so yeah, our librarian said, um, the so regarding the challenges of analyzing a collection or even purchases, this would be very time consuming and subjective unless we are analyzing, so analyzing meaning like indicators for success, like seeing if they've done a good job, analyzing the very specific content areas, diversity of authors and characters, et cetera, et cetera. Additionally, we are not comfortable with the inclusion of instructional materials in the policy, and we don't have control over ultimate decisions of instructional materials. There is also a challenge of the availability of quality materials, especially those for younger grades. We may be able to use a diversity analyzer through our library automation system. However, we are still waiting for it to be activated. So we don't know exactly how well it will work. Um, what are the parameters for holding ourselves accountable to this policy? There are many factors considered, including availability of quality of text, reading level range, et cetera. So it seems like it's um, just a little more complicated. It's not as easy as being like, oh, just do this and this, right? to analyze whether we're successful with this policy. Um, but they're gonna, you know, they continue to meet on a pretty regular basis and they're thinking about this. So I don't know what the ultimate decision, like maybe we just decide this time not to put the indicators of success in the policy. I feel like that seems like the easiest solution. What are other people's thoughts on that? Um, I feel like we don't need indicators of success. Um, to me, this policy, I feel like is more useful in case a member of the community decides they want to come in and, and ban something. Um, then we can go back to this policy and say, you know, that this is our official policy. We're not going to ban a nonfiction book or. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's it's also, you know, it's kind of a nebulous thing to measure. Um, but I do agree with the librarian's feedback that the school instructional instructional materials should probably not be included because they don't have any control over that. Um, anyone else with thoughts on whether we should try to craft language in here? for indicators of success or not. I mean, I tend to agree with what Sagey said and just, and I also tend to wanna, with this particular policy that was drafted by our librarians, sort of follow their lead. And it's something that we can always revisit again in the future. You know, we can monitor it once or twice and then see how it's functioning. And if we need additional language, we can add it then. I'll just say I'm <clears throat> that that I'm I'm fine with that. I would say I feel like sort of like on a 
as a principal thing, it would be good for us to include in our policies what success looks like so that we know what we're aiming for. Um, but I also totally hear you about supporting our librarians and giving them the backup that they're asking for. Okay. It sounds like they have a tool that could come in the future. They just don't know what it will that diversity do yet. For that. So it, I think it might, we might wanna leave that off until we know what that tool is gonna do. Yeah. Another thing we tossed around at a previous board meeting was the, you know, the um, statement of intent here reads that we're providing a barrier free, safe and supportive learning environment. One that affirms the identity of each student and acknowledges and celebrates differences to create a sense of belonging for each child. That could be a thing that that to me sounds like an indicator of success and that that would be something we could measure through a student survey, not that we would only survey students about this one policy, but if we had like an annual student survey, this is one of the things that we could be asking about. Okay, so for now, it sounds like um, the will of the board is sort of to leave the this language out of the policy for now, yep. await, await these different um, technologies that might come in the future that could help the librarians uh, analyze the and measure success and revisit it in the future. I also think it's a larger question for the policy com committee to consider around what Mia is saying around like what does success look like with this policy, with all of our policies. So I'm going to resolve that comment and I'm going to resolve the comment down below with the feedback from the librarians. Okay, so let's see here. Um, <coughs> okay, so there had been a question about like potentially including some language around stakeholder engagement. I think a lot of people were thinking about students when they were talking about this. Um, stakeholder engagement and selection of materials. So like maybe once a year surveying students. Um, could something like this live in the language of policy or maybe in the procedure? And um, without me prompting the librarians, they had they read the notes and the comments and they had concerns about including that in the policy, um, that it might be challenging for them to do that. And they also, you know, I think I didn't have a chance to talk to them in person, but I suspect that, you know, they're the professionals that have been trained to do this job. And that um, if we say that there will be a process for stakeholders to choose library materials, that that might put them in an uncomfortable position. I also feel yeah, I also feel comfortable taking the lead of the librarians on that one. Um, I also feel that in my observation of being in the schools, librarians do have, um, they have kind of less formal ways possibly of collecting, you know, feedback from, from students. It might not capture all students, but I could see how that could be difficult, challenging, impossible, or uncomfortable for the librarians. So I, I would be comfortable leaving that out. I will say that, you know, there's still a procedure that's linked down below that needs some revising. So it's possible that we put something in the procedure in the future. I think it could live there and like not in the policy, at least for now. Because I think like the spirit of what we were getting at in terms of like being inclusive of community feedback <laughs> and not necessarily like a directive that stakeholders will get to choose library materials. Um, I think it could still be in there somewhere, but maybe it lives in the procedure eventually. Any other feedback on that? Should I resolve it? I think we can resolve it. We resolve it, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so Mia, I think we addressed this in your, in the previous question about around like, um, I'll let you speak to this. I'm not sure. I feel like we emailed about this and then I feel like it was related to what we, the conversation around um, indicators of success. 
No, it's separate from that, but I finally just sent you okay. an email today with the actual. Oh, okay. Yeah. That I said out loud. I, I meant to send that about a month ago and I didn't. So um, it now has the, my suggestion is just for the, this sentence to read, building diverse and inclusive collections is one of the ways we act on our core values. That's all. Okay, what I have in your email, let me just drop it in as a comment and we can revise it or you can type in and revise it too. This is what I have from the email is one way we live our core values. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna make that revision unless anyone feels uncomfortable with that. I'm just gonna type it right into the document. And I don't know if it's within the scope of work for the equity audit, but it seems like something that they might be able to, that the um, that might fall under that that umbrella of work. Maybe they could have some, you know, review this and offer some su suggestions. Or yeah, I wondered about that too because they're going to review materials. Yeah. So does everyone feel comfortable with that revision? I'm going to resolve it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, um, all right. So all students should be able to find themselves in our library books and school instructional materials. So I think first we need to change this to, I think this was originally like later it defines library, library materials. Yeah, right I below think, it. Yep. So I think it's meant to be that and not school instructional materials. So if everyone feels comfortable with that revision, we'll do it. We'll use that language instead. I think it's um, redundant. I think you can take out the library books and just put library materials because the, the definition says includes all print, non-print and equipment resources. Ah, oh, mm -hmm. that's the redundancy. Yeah. Should I keep it like this though, where it says library, library materials? Do we all like that? No. Okay. <laughs> I can't see what you're doing. I'm looking at an old oh, you can. Uh, if you click, if people are listening on on Zoom, if you click on the link, then um, you'll come to the live document. I believe you. Okay, so the language around all students should be able to find themselves in our library materials. Um, the policy committee had asked a question. Um, it, it came up as a point of discussion in the policy committee of whether this is like a little too uh, broad and, and challenging to actually succeed in doing, right? So it's like every single student, every single type of human being should be able to find themselves in the library materials. Um, the library, so we just put that to the librarians and asked them what they thought about that. And they said that the wording had come from the Vermont State Library Association um, statement on intellectual free freedom. We determined that it seems redundant because the wording is already in place in the previous paragraph in the policy section, as well as the items in the implementation section. We would be fine with removing that section. Also, the librarians would like to remove instructional materials. Okay. So... Does anyone have any suggestions about, I mean, I don't think they're talking about, I think they're just talking about removing this sentence um, and not the previous section that they're referencing. Does anyone have any suggestions about, my brain is, I've been at work all day and I like just transitioned to this meeting. So I'm struggling being creative with uh, wordsmithing if anyone has suggestions. My hunch would be that the librarians are talking about that first sentence. Mm -hmm. I think they'd be in full support of the next two sentences. Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. But yeah. I guess my question is, do we want to remove this? They're fine with removing it. Do we want to remove it or do we want to reword it or... Does anyone this else? Jill, this is Jill. I actually liked it. I think it, it may not be exactly those words, but it's definitely the intent, right? That we're, we're all trying to move towards as a country is that students should be able to see themselves in their materials. And that can mean, you know, a student of a single parent, a student 
from a different background. It can be in all kinds of things, but I, I actually like it. <coughs> what about diverse library materials are essential in a student's education? Or access to diverse library materials is essential in a student's education. All students should be able to learn and grow. The rest of it. Right, or it could be like, well, I mean, it already is should, right? So it's not like if we don't have a book in the library that every single student, you know, like there might be a student out there that, that can't find themselves represented and maybe that needs to be rectified, right? But maybe we could word it, um, we want our students to be able to find themselves in our library materials or something like that. MRPS strives to ensure all students. I mean, could we say something like all students should find our library's material welcoming? Or should then you, they then you get tricky materials? Sorry, what was the last sentence they you said? Be welcome in our library materials. I kind of think it's pretty strong in some of our library yeah, materials. Yeah. yeah. That, is, that involves a lot. I, would, I think we should just get rid of it. It's kind of confusing. And... I'm just going to type in MR, I'm just going to type in what Libby said MRPS um, strives. How, how did you word it for all? Uh, you said strives to ensure all students can see or find go. themselves. Yeah. The woman with pneumonia has got it. <laughs> <laughs> that I, all I students. Like, I feel like that paragraph almost would fit better in the statement of intent. Um, but yep. Yeah, I was I was thinking that the statement of intent was missing something about library materials myself earlier. So and really, the way. Sorry. Go ahead. The way it should just be one sentence, um, not three uh, independent sentences, because it, yeah, it could be one sentence that is a part of the statement of intent. Mm, right. They all, all three of the sentences start with, start the, with the same beginning. I just put a little comma in there. <laughs> and yeah, two actually. Um, so it's not it's one additional thought. I, so um, the, the library resources are are essentially infinite and and i don't think there's anything wrong with saying that that all students should be able to find themselves i think that the issue is that it's not in the library materials it's in the access that the students have through the library mm. good point so scott i'm liking this train of thought but how can i capture this do i just change this back to this and then take these, we're taking these and putting it up here with this statement of intent? Or you're saying that these three sentences could be one sentence? I think I'm saying both. Yeah, there's no or, it's an and. Um, and okay, I, so, I don't have access to edit, so I can't do it, so. So can you go into suggesting? Can you do suggesting? I can request edit access. Let me just add you here. Um, okay, I just gave you editing access. Uh, oops, I put that in and I put that in the wrong spot. Okay, so I moved those sentences up to the top and then I'll wait to see what your, do we wanna do it in suggesting edit mode or do we wanna just, do it. <laughs> do it. I'd say just do it. Okay. So we're going to let Scott work on that. I don't think I'm going to see if there's, okay. So there's just one more comment down below on the procedures. And it says, um, Libby will want to make some changes to, the, to this procedure to personalize it for our district. So just that's fine. That would happen after we approve this policy and then post it to the website. Is that okay, Libby, or is there something that, that you want? Great. Yep. Okay. Um, oh, I was supposed to add some links in there, which I did not do. 
Okay, so this one, um, the selection of instructional materials, we have not adopted this recommended policy from VSBO, VSBA. And um, so, I mean, maybe we want to adopt this policy. It is relating to some of the work that Zach and Merrick has been have been doing, but it's not something that's been on our priority list, um, D32. So I think for now, I just have to remove it from down here and then we can consider looking into adopting it later. Does that sound right? Yeah, that sounds right to me, Emma. And I will link that F22. While Scott is working, um, does anyone else have any other additional comments before this goes to vote to be adopted? or for a fourth read. You need a fourth read or are we <laughs> gonna go, where's that? I think it looks great. Yeah. Well, we're just put it in the consent agenda of the next meeting, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No other comments? Nope. We can make edits right now in this meeting. <laughs> okay, so I'll just link that and then, and then it will be ready um, for Anna. So, Scott, are you ready to unveil your new language? He's How's working with like a chance for you work. Yes, I just I don't like the word books because so much of what's available is not just books, but everything else I think is fine. Mm. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was something kind of like sweet about the phrase relative safety of books, but I'm not going to fight you on it. <laughs> I totally isn't, it isn't it still there? <laughs> Scott doesn't like books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, relative safety of books in particular. Um, so Scott, do you want to read that? Do you want me to read the whole paragraph? You want to read the whole paragraph just for to get it on record? Uh, you're great at it. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So the statement of intent would read: Montpelier Roxbury School District intends to provide a barrier-free, safe, and supportive learning environment for all of our students. One that affirms the identity of each student and acknowledges and celebrates differences to create a sense of belonging for each child. All students should be able to find themselves in the materials available through our libraries, be able to learn and grow in the relative safety of those materials, and have access to authoritative resources that promote critical reading and thinking. I love it. Yeah. I like that. Yay. <laughs> okay. I am going to resolve this comment, and then all that's needed is the link, and so I'll make sure to do that before the night is over. Um, there, was, there was a policy, Libby, that we were gonna put on the agenda just to have it be removed. I forget what the number was, but maybe we need to put that on the next agenda. Oh, wasn't that in the consent agenda? It's on the consent oh. agenda. Oh, I totally knew that because I voted for that agenda. So <laughs> I knew that. All right. Okay, excellent. So we can move that to the green. Um, so does the equity committee want to talk about their sure. proposal? Yep. We um, so we put out an RFP in uh, December and received five proposals from different vendors. And as a committee narrowed it down to three finalists, we interviewed those three finalists um, on Monday. They were the Equity Leadership Group, Equity Journey Partners, and Insight Education Group. Then the Equity Committee met this morning to discuss our um, you know, assessment of the proposals and the what we learned in the interviews. And from that, we determined that we're recommending to the board to award the contract for the equity audit to Equity Leadership Group. Um, just as a kind of summary, we thought 
what, you know, when we read all five proposals, we thought, yeah, it looks like these five groups would do roughly the same activities in order to audit. And so it was nice to see from the interviews, just the ways that equity leadership group stood out. And for us, it was um, their team has an incredibly um, diverse array of experiences, both um, professional. I think we met every, sing every single person we met had a uh, education background um and or or work like has been working as an educator for their career as well as lived experience um they um will work to involve key stakeholders from the very beginning of the process of the equity audit they um wowed us with their organizational skills and um they also we also like that they're going to be including some follow up meetings with Libby and her team after they present the report to us as a way of getting us started on implementation of um, the recommendations that they find. So those were the things that stood out to us with this group um, and why we are recommending that we award them the contract. We wanted to see if board members had any questions before we do that. Questions? Thanks for, the, thanks for the great work on that. Do we need to approve it? Yes. Yep, we would need, and I could just make a motion. I move okay. to approve awarding the contract for the equity audit to equity leadership group. A second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. And I think the next is executive session to just do a contracts negotiation update. Um, yeah. I don't know how we want to do. We want to move to a separate room. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, do you remember the motion language? Oh, uh, wait, uh, Anna put it in the email. Mm -hmm. I move to find that premature general public knowledge regarding contract negotiations would clearly place the board at a, sub a substantial disadvantage if discussed in public. Do have a second? Second. Discussion? Uh, uh, do we have to read the second motion? We have to first have to approve the second. First, have to approve the first. Uh, oh, the second. Okay. Um, and Libby, we can see your screen. We can still see your screen, Libby. Sorry. Well, that's not good. There you go. All those in favor? I think it's only about board meeting stuff. I. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> Uh, now I have a second motion to go to. I move to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations under the provisions of Title I, Section 313, A1A of Vermont statutes. Um, all those in favor? Oh, wait, second. Oh, second. Anyone? Second. I'll second. Um, discussion? No, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Doesn't, uh, 